Welcome to Flying to the Res on a UFO. With Brilliant <laughs> Today we want to talk about UFOs and also aliens. Because yes. we've been finding that topic super interesting. We find it very interesting. And it seems to be coming up quite a lot lately. Yeah, it's not every year that the Navy says, okay, UFOs are real. The, the, those are those recordings, right? Like TikTok recordings or whatever. Yeah, Navy said they're real. Yes, the Navy said, yep, they're real. And now the people who record, at least one guy who was recording, was talking about them and stuff. He had quite a few adventures. But anyways, we went to talk to you about our thoughts about UFOs and aliens and also any experiences we may have had. What do you think, Larry? Sounds good. Might have been kind of tame, actually. At least the only ones that I remember. That I'm sure is... if we had a little bit of a hypnotic regression, I might have some more memories. But for right now, I just remember last week when we jumped in our, our what do you call those? Water trough hot tub. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> cattle, cattle in a horse trough turned into a hot tub. If you ever want to make a hot tub, by the way, that's the way to do it. Hundred bucks instead of three thousand bucks. Anyways, uh, what looked like <clears throat> a meteor, except it didn't streak across the sky. It just went straight at us, and it got as bright as the sun, and then it disappeared. So I guess it could have theoretically been a meteor pointing straight at us, but yeah, it's not very likely. I think it would have hit us. Whoa! It would have hit us. Well, yeah, because it didn't drift to the side. It only just went straight at us. And it just got really, really bright. And then, ew, faded. So it was like it, it uh, came into uh, visibility and then disappeared. Anyway, it's well. kind of like pushing the, pushing the boundary of, is that a UFO? Yeah, something unidentified. It was definitely <laughs> flying. Probably was an object. I don't know what it was. I don't, know, I don't know who was in it. It might have been a Tic Tac. <laughs> you have better stories, though. Yes, I have lots of stories. One of my superpowers is that I can detect UFOs and aliens. Where, if they're like 50... Well, actually, I can detect them and see how far they are. So, like, if I scan the area right now, there's one about... 15 miles away to that way, which is toward Victoria. Towards Victoria, so it's north from here. Um, and yeah, so yeah, that puts me in a little bit of an older state because I have to expand my awareness to detect them. And so I've had quite a lot of contact with UFO. I mean, UFOs and also um, ETs. Shall we start with the little, when I was little? Or? Yeah, probably. I think we should start with uh, your two little friends that helped you grow up and not get in too much trouble. <laughs> yeah, those are really fascinating. So when I was little, I had two little friends. They were about my size and I was I don't know, from when I was born to when I was age seven, maybe, or eight, or something like that. Maybe a little bit younger. They were with me all the time, and it was a boy and a girl. Their hair looked funny, but looking at the, my memory of them from this perspective now as an adult, it appeared that they were wearing wigs. <laughs> That's funny. I remember their heads were bigger than regular kids and their eyes were definitely bigger than regular kids. And um, they were very funny. They seemed to act older than regular kids, but they dressed uh, like kids and their hair was like kids. 
and they would hang out with me and tell me what to do basically so I wouldn't attract too much attention to myself. So there was one incident for example where my parents, they were professors at the local university in Valparaiso and um, they wanted to figure out which one of the children if may, and hopefully all of them were geniuses. Always nice to have a genius in the family. Yeah, especially seeing as my mom was a genius. So, anyways, they wanted to measure our IQ and whatnot. So they brought these guys from the Department of Psychology to test us. It's very fun. Lots of fun. Anyways, I was really young at the time. I hadn't even started school, so I don't know what age people start in school in Chile. Probably like four or something. No idea. Yeah, I don't either. So, anyways, they came to the house and they had a box, a rectangular like box, um, like a tray. It was like a tray. And they poured out, like, I don't know, about 20, 30, 40, 50 pieces of wood that were all painted different colors. And they were all different geometrical shapes. And they told me, they looked at me and they said, all these pieces fit into this rectangle tray perfectly, but you have to figure out how to put them on here for, so that they can fit in properly. And I looked at the, all the pieces and I looked at the tray and I knew what to do. I knew how to put them down, right? But before they arrived, my little friends spoke to me and they said, listen, these people are going to bring some really fun toys, a tray, a wooden tray, and all these wooden little pieces of different colors, and they want you to put them all together to fit in. You mustn't do it. And I said, but why not? And she said, no, no, it's really important that you don't do it. Do you understand? And I said, yes, it's very important that I don't do it. So I said, well, what do I do? I said, just put one in your mouth and chew it. <laughs> So I was like, um, okay. <laughs> I didn't know why they wanted me to put the pieces in my, my, my mouth and chew them, but okay. So anyways, when they when I saw them, I got super excited and I started grabbing them and started putting them into the, into the tray. And then I remembered, wait, I'm not supposed to do that, right? Because they told me. So, and I think they were screaming into my head, you know, telepathically. So then afterwards, I started like sliding them around and then I grabbed one or two and put them in my mouth and chewed them. And they were just like, ah, oh, whatever, you know, okay, next, you know, for the next kid. My brother and sister weren't able to do it anyways. <laughs> <laughs> but I also like disappointed because I really wanted to do it, you know. So when everybody left the room, then I was able to, the, the little guys you know then my little friends told me it was okay and I could play with them so I put them all into the train they all fitted in very perfectly and then I had to empty it out you know make sure nobody saw it but those were really nice and forward like 40 years <laughs> nearly 30 something years into yeah. the future I was in my house in California with my new baby and I could hear them and sense my friends right and I said to them hey this is ridiculous. Oh yeah, because at some point when I was little, they said to me that I wasn't going to be able to see them again physically, but I, they would always be there and I could talk to them anytime I wanted. But they needed to leave because that my job wasn't to talk about my invisible friends growing up, right? And then I also needed to learn and I didn't have enough information to just be a regular kid. And I wouldn't be if I always hung out with them. So. I couldn't see them anymore for the rest of my life. So for over 30 something years, I'm with my baby in California and I'm listening to them, these friends of mine and talking to them. And Cause they said that you, could, you weren't gonna get to see them anymore, but you could still talk to them telepathically. Correct, yeah. Yeah, I could talk to them telepathically and I knew when they were there and I could call them anytime. So I was chatting with them and I said, you know what, this is so ridiculous, why don't I, why don't you just appear to me? I can, I'd like to look at you again. 
And I said, no, because your body's going to get scared. And I said, yeah, right. I've known you forever. I'm not going to get scared. It's okay. He says, no, no, you won't, but your body will. Your body will freak out. So we're not going to. He says, oh, come on. Really? Just do it. I'll be fine. So they did. And my body screamed super loud and ran all the way down the stairs and into the kitchen. I don't know. To this day, when she went into the kitchen, somebody suggested there's knives in the kitchen. <laughs> so that was fun. And they were there, like physically, like just like you and me, you know, right there. I, if I could reach out and touch them, they were solid. They were not like wobbly or inner eye or anything. They were literally there in the room with me and the baby. I grabbed my baby, by the way, before I ran out. <laughs> but anyways, that was quite funny. Um, and we were pretty sure those guys are little aliens. Yeah. Yeah, super, super not sure. Actually, not actually little children with wigs and funny clothes. Yeah, absolutely. What, so, about, what, <clears throat> what about the ones in the mountain? Those were interesting. Story. That's an interesting story. Uh, so forward to... Reverse to 1970s. 73. Yeah, so you have to forward to 1973. And by then I was like six seven or seven. Ish. Yeah, depending on the month, six or seven. Could have been 1972 maybe. So we, I was in the living room and I remember I wasn't wearing any shoes and because I rarely wore shoes, I didn't like wearing shoes. And my dad gets a phone call, the phone rings, he answers it, he doesn't say anything, and he hangs up, and he says, everybody to the car, we're leaving, come on, everyone in the car. So we're all going to the car, and I said, well, I haven't got my shoes on. He says, no, I don't care, just get in the car. So we got in the car, and we started driving, and we were driving for two, three hours, and I remember we took the back roads out of Valparaiso and we went up into the mountains towards the Andes. We were like, we started driving into the Andes. It was quite far. At some point, there was a really large area on the side of the mountain that wasn't a cliff. <laughs> One side of the mountain is a massive cliff, right? And the other side, where's the mountain, right? The mountain is, but there was an area, like a parking area. So we pulled out and got into that area and parked. And there was lots of cars there, I remember. And I remember seeing some of my parents' friends. One of the guys was a senator, I think, from the government. And he was there with his two daughters, his son and his wife. Anyways, we got out of the car and we started walking towards one of the sides of the mountain. And as we were walking towards it, it opens up like a large, like hanger. large hangar. Yeah, like a large hangar. It opened up. It's really big. It was really, really big. So we get in there. And I remember there was lots of men wearing gray suits. They were quite tall, they were white. Um, they had like blue eyes, green eyes, gray eyes, but they were all wearing um, gray suits and their hair was like brown, light brown. And we got in and there was all these desks with lights on them and things. And all the families were taken to little groups and one of the men would talk to them and for, for like we were all walked around and shown things and the other side I remember it opened up there was like windows you know but I remember how could there be windows there it was in the mountains you yeah, know it makes no sense. made no sense at all so we're walking around and anyways all the groups separated and I started walking around because I was so small I was like I was six or seven but I was really like really small for my age I would probably as small as a four-year-old or something. I was really small when I was little. Because you didn't eat. Because I didn't eat. That is correct. I did not eat. So anyways. Plus um, you're small. Huh? <laughs> plus you're small. Yeah, plus I'm small. <laughs> so anyways, 
we were in that room and I started walking around and I remember walking towards this particular family uh, the friends, right? The senator and his family and um, they were chatting and the girl, they were saying, well, yeah, we can place you in Paris with uh, the whole family. You will never know you were anywhere else and um, it would be like you were born and bred there, you know? And they were, no, 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 we're going to stay here. But their daughter, who probably must have been, um, I don't know, a teen, she started crying and said, no, I don't want to stay here. I don't want to have that experience here. Because they said something really bad was going to happen in Chile. And sure enough, there was a right-wing military coup in 1973. And our family and their family was destroyed, you know, their, their lives and our lives were destroyed. Parents were taken to concentration camps and tortured and everything like that. Anyway, this girl said she didn't want to experience that. She really did not want to live through that. So she rather, she really wanted to go and live in Paris instead. And the guy that was talking to them said, well, actually what we can do is just take the girl, put her in a family in France and she will never know any difference. She would have always been part of that family and you won't remember her. You will not know that you ever had an older daughter. And they, they said, okay, you know, after crying and talking about it for a while, I was fascinated about this. That always fascinates me too, is why would everybody pick a beautiful life in Paris? I know, right? It's <laughs> like so bizarre. So anyways, I was like so fascinated about it and I couldn't understand, like you said, you know, why wouldn't everybody go there? But they decided that and then he walks away, goes to a desk and I follow him. Um, he's sitting on a desk, looking at all these light things on the desk. So I, I sit on his lap, right? And I'm looking at the desk and he's like laughing. probably and thinks you can't understand what's going on. It's just pretty lights. Yeah, it's all pretty lights. Because you're a little tiny toddler. Yes. I mean, I looked a lot younger than I actually was, right? And um, I'm looking at things and I'm touching the, the, the desk full of lights. And and he finally he pays attention to me. Obviously, you can't ignore me very long if I'm sitting on your lap, right? And I'm asking what's this and what's that and what's the other. So he looks at me. And he says, um, who, you know, who are you with? And um, I point to my family and it's like, oh, okay. And then he looks more at me like he's looking, really looking into my eyes. And at some point he says, what are you? <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean? I'm a girl. He says, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then he says, okay, well, we have to get up now go back to your family so I get up and I run back to my family and they're having the same conversation with this other guy about moving them to Paris Paris again right maybe moving the families that are friends together the transition is easier or something I don't know yeah, maybe. and my parents are saying no way Jose that's not gonna happen and my brother and sister don't want to go either um, I don't know what the hell is going on pretty much but it's like well that's the decision for the family. And then I see the guy who was with the other family, I run back to him and I just follow him around the place pretty much. And, and then everybody starts like getting up, ready to leave. And he looks at me and he says, listen, he says, when you leave this place, you mustn't look back. You mustn't look back at me. You mustn't look back at all. You just look at the car eyes forward, you get into your car and you drive away. You don't look back, you don't wave, you don't look out of the window when you're driving away, you don't do any of that, okay? I said, but why? You just have to do it, just trust me. Don't look back. And I said, okay. Because you knew I wanted to, I was going to wave. And, wave goodbye. Yeah. So I give him a hug, he says, bye-bye, you know, and we'll probably meet again. I says, okay, cool. 
and then um, start walking away and I don't know how many yards out of the place we're getting close to our car and I look back and I wave <laughs> of course because as you do you know if you're a little kid and then I remember he like shakes his head you know like really big like eyes you know like no 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 so I, I remember you know and I look straight back and I pretend like I was scratching my head or something and then we get into the car and my my brother and sister super quiet my mom and dad super quiet we get in the car and we start driving home and they're quiet now that is really really odd and strange because my brother and sister would fight in the car every single time and on the way there they had been fighting continuously and i mean kicking each other punching each other screaming my parents screaming at them to stop that was every trip that was normal and i would try to get out of their way by jumping in, in on my dad's lap while he was driving on my mom's lap on the side the, the driver's the passenger side you know I was like that's my escape but they were sitting quietly they weren't saying a word and neither were my parents it was the strangest experience the strangest trip home ever I can imagine ever so like after that I remember every um, every now and then I would ask them about that place and they would just go blank in their eyes and then continue like I had never spoken but we went to visit this family that was there and we walked in and I asked about the older girl I can't remember her name now but I asked about her and they said what are you talking about I says yes yeah, such and such you know let's say Melody you know Oh, whomever. They said, no, no, we only have two children, a boy and a girl. So no, no, you have two daughters and one of them is like older. She's the eldest. I said, no, we don't. You must be confusing us with somebody else. We don't have an older daughter. Said, but I, you do, I said, and I, I, I ran to her room and I opened the door. This is her room. And it was like a craft room or sewing room or something. It was like all sorts of stuff in there. And there was no sign of her anywhere. I looked at the photographs, there's no photographs of her. It was like she was erased from the... I mean, they didn't know she even existed. I was like, whoa, that is bizarre. And by then, my parents were getting a little bit, you know, freaked out by me and stop it and stop lying. And the usual thing that people say to their kids of that age, you know, in the 1970s. So, yeah, that was that experience. <laughs> um, I think one of the things that that guy told me was that he had little children too somewhere in the universe. But they went in the cave. I remember yeah. something about it seemed that. like they were there to pull out their ground crew if they wanted, I guess. Or how do you think it was? It was something. I know that family was beautiful, really high frequency. So maybe a possibility yeah so you didn't have to go through a coup and have the stuff if you weren't really wanting to go for it I yeah suppose. you had a, a way out of it but they chose not to so I can't understand why anybody would choose to want to go through a coup I guess they thought they were on the winning side well the words my father used and my mom too was we're not going to abandon our people here we have to fight for our freedom and you know our dreams and our president so we're patriots and we're going to fight for the people i see how we're did gonna... that work out <laughs> it didn't work out at all <laughs> <clears throat> did their people appreciate it nope the opposite actually ah it's funny how that works so that was so the motto of that story is if you get called to the mountains to uh, escape a coup escape absolutely take the take the out the out <laughs> go to paris have a lovely life no point in fighting that shit absolutely yeah so that was another experience that was pretty fascinating so how do you think they control your memory or the memory of everyone else but not you i don't know but even as adults even as adults even today if i 
speak to my brother or sister about this uh, that uh, incident. And even when my mom was alive in the early 90s, um, I would regularly ask her about it. Every single time, all of them would, their eyes go gloss over. They would go really quiet. And then they would start talking about whatever it was that we were talking before I mentioned the, the incident. Every single time I tested it for years, I tested it well into adulthood and the same thing would happen. They would go glossy eyed and then like I never brought it up, man. <laughs> Why do you think so many people don't remember their alien abductions or alien visits or alien trips or alien stuff? They just have missing time. I think it breaks their reality too much, or uh, their game, or their singularity or personality but or something. they remember it when they're hypnotized, it doesn't do anything to them. Yeah, that's really strange, isn't it? When they're hypnotized and they remember, it doesn't... I mean, and when they wake up, after they've been hypnotized, they kind of like say, well, that's a little bit strange, but it's nice to be able to fill in the time. They don't go crack, quacky or anything. Well, some of them do. They have to have a lot of support and therapy and support groups and things. Okay. So that's two of the stories with the aliens. Which one shall I yeah, tell I went, next? I went to Mount Adams one time. Actually went twice. And we used night vision goggles and looked at the sky with the night vision. And we saw satellites go by and we saw what could have been UFOs. Because they did things satellites don't do like stop or turn a corner and things like that. But they didn't come down. Oh wait, if you focused on them and gave them attention, sometimes they would get brighter. They'd stop and get brighter, like answering you or something. You have any idea why they do that? Why they get brighter? Yeah, why would why would lights like that, and what are the lights? They would stop in the sky and you look at them and they get like power up and get brighter, 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 and then dim out and then go off. And all that happened was you would gather together and looking at them and then focus some attention on them and then ask them to power up and then they power up. I think it is communication, but I know that in that area, when I went there too, and um, when I asked why weren't they landing and just staying up in the sky, it was because it was being monitored by the government, shadow government, and um, if they did land or anything, I mean, they would be fine because they were fast enough they could escape, but they would destroy the people below, the government would. So they didn't want to put the people in danger that went there to look at them. Oh, kind of like we were listening to the Navy boy, not really a young fellow, but I guess he goes, no, he was pretty well experienced by the time he was on this Navy ship doing the radar on the Aegis ship. I think it was the Aegis. I don't know what class, Ticonderoga or something. Anyway, he saw the UFOs. He vectored the jets to the UFOs, the little Tic Tac UFOs. He followed them around, traced them on their radar, saw them with his binoculars, and it affected him in a big way, right? He began to be uh, able to manifest things. He'd think it, and the next day it would show up. Like ice cream comes the next day. Like marbles, the next day marbles show up. That kind of manifestation, not like... A specific, uh, well, must, he might have probably tried a few times too, but the skills and abilities altered when he became aware. So it's his reality shifted at that point where he became aware there was more to hear than just the jets that he's watching on the, on the radar, that there's beings or there's craft or there's another reality. So... I guess you're right in a sense. His reality broke, but it broke bigger. So now more things were real, not just the little bit of stuff that he knows about, but the little bit of stuff past that so begin to open up. Things that he didn't even know manifesting, you know? What do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. when I was hearing that story, I also thought that it felt to me that the reason why he was able to see more manifest easier and faster and all these things was because his construct of reality had been expanded dramatically by these crafts that he saw right I wonder what happened to everyone else not everyone well 
I guess everyone's story is a little bit different when you haven't heard everybody's story, but in the case of this boy, he was uh, very high ranked and very well experienced in his uh, job in the Navy. He'd done it for 20 years, that's about as many as they let you do it. And when they tied the ship up, he got transferred off the ship immediately and never went back underway and never got to see any more of that stuff. And he was like invisible to all of it until he saw it on TV while he was uh, working as a, I guess, kind of a volunteer waiter cook slash open the restaurant at a bowling alley after he got out of the military. I thought it was golf club or something. Yeah, golf club. But well, he opened the restaurant there because the golf club was going to go bankrupt and he wanted to help them. So he saw the Tic Tac on TV, dropped the plate, and now he's uh, telling his story a little bit, but he was pretty much, like you were saying, the UFOs don't come down to land because the government will do stuff. He got pretty much eliminated from his job. The ship tied up. He wasn't expecting to get transferred. He got transferred off the ship and never saw anybody and talked about any of that ever again. Well, until now. So I wonder what they would do if they did land at Mount Adams and one of the ships did come down and the military did know about it. I mean, it might be different now than then, right? I don't know. <laughs> I think that the military like to control the contact 100%, you know. I think they like to control things. So regular people having these type of experiences and not very easily controlled. Well, maybe because their reality expands to the degree that they're less controllable. Yeah, but I think that situation with the Tic Tac um, thing, that the video and all that, and him in particular, that were taken off the ship was to cover it up, you know, to make it go away. He even said that the recordings and the, the double recordings and triple recordings that they do in order to investigate things later were deleted. <laughs> So that's pretty unusual, right? Obviously they hadn't been because they were released later on, so... But yeah, it's, it's quite fascinating really, the, the whole E.T. thing. Yeah, because I've always wondered why they would go to so much trouble to hide it. But it does make sense that uh, they would do their best to tamp it down and hide it and ridicule it if the effect of uh, having those experiences expands your awareness so that you're not so small in your reality anymore. Those those people who aren't so small in their reality are a lot more hard to control. Yes, they are very hard to control. That's why I would tell people, wake up. <laughs> An awakened individual, somebody who ex has an expanded awareness and its response is extremely hard, if not impossible to control. So, yeah, good point. That could be the reason. That's finally the... The only reason that has ever made any sense to me. Yeah. So, another experience I wanted to share was about two or three years ago, Larry and I were driving back from California, I think it was. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. right. That was down by Santa. I don't know, by the walnut trees, I guess, or whatever those trees are, almond trees. Almond trees? Yeah, on the freeway on the way up. Yeah. But I don't know about any Walmart trees, but I do remember Starbucks. Okay, well, there was Starbucks. <laughs> so one of the funny things about E.T. is that they love Starbucks. I, th I think it's one of those cos cosmic jokes or something. And you're very likely to meet one if you have a Starbucks near a military base. They really like to hang out there for some reason. Anyways, we were driving up and I think we were near I don't know where we were, but it was near like a really large military installation near the highway. And um, I needed to go to the restroom real bad. So we stopped at a Starbucks. This was before the COVID thing, obviously. It was a couple of years ago. Um, and I ran in and there was two doors to this Starbucks. There was a front door and a back door. And this is usually what we'll, where you'll find them. There's more than one door in the Starbucks. If you want to go yelling hunting, go to Starbucks near military installations that have two doors, a front door and a back door. Anyways, I'm getting close to the bathroom and I look up over at the table that is by the back door and there's an alien there. It looks like a man, looks like a human man. 
he has about three or four laptops in front of him and some like the cases to carry them and other equipment on the under the, the table and I look at him and I go oh my god he's an alien and I'm looking back and Larry hasn't come into the store yet and um, I'm thinking oh my god I better hurry up in the toilets because I want to tell Larry about this alien so he can look at him too yeah because I've been wanting to see one for a long time yes so he looks at me right as I'm running into the bathroom I go real fast as fast as I can go and then I wash my hands run out again and he's gone darn it like, he's gone and I I mean it was fat I mean it could have been less than a minute two minutes max and he's gone and all his stuff is gone like his computers his equipment everything is gone right he obviously ran out the back door because he saw you saw him or what yeah for some reason they can detect me too they know that I know who they are they know that I know what they are <laughs> Reminds me of your interview with an alien book. If you're wondering about alien stuff a little bit, that was written about ten years ago or so, wasn't it? More like yeah, it was more 15, than 20. years ago. Fifteen, twenty. Yeah, eleven. Yeah. Eleven or twelve years ago. We mostly expect aliens are going to be the little short guys with wigs and whatever, but they don't all come and show up like that. So how are you supposed to recognize an alien if they don't look like an alien? <laughs> what if they look like a person? Well, there's a lot of aliens who are humanoid, um, and some of them are human, but from other planets. Um, they just, their frequency is different. And I think that is related to, for example, a human being, they are connected to the human frequency of the planet, Earth. And I'm thinking that aliens from other planets, even if they look human, they, their frequency is different. But I can tell if I, I, I mean, I've gone, for example, to Costco um, once and as soon as I walked in, I knew 100% that there was an alien in the store. And that alien knew that very instance that I was there. And I started walking towards it and it was moving away as fast as I could walk. And eventually made its way around and th like uh, through the aisles and stuff. And it got out of the store. <laughs> I couldn't. I could never catch it. Well, they must. they you know, in the, some of the stories I read, we read um, Artie Six. What's Artie's name? The lady with the Six Indian killer. story, Six Killer. Yeah. If you want to read some more interesting books about aliens and Native Americans, Artie Six Killer's got a really, really good set of books that collects a lot of stories. But one of the stories I remember specifically, the aliens was standing out in the snowstorm and uh, dying. And the, the fellow with the snowplow job stopped the snowplow, looked out and saw there was a little alien guy standing there. And he was a bit freaked out, but you it's can't. <laughs> part, of job, you're, part of the job is if you find somebody on the side of the road, you have to stop, otherwise they'll die of exposure in the middle of the night, in the middle of a blizzard. So he stopped and opened the door to let the alien in and the alien ran and hid. And well, it's like, not right away. Not right away. Wait, 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 no, didn't he, didn't he go hide and then came yeah. back out, he went to look for him? I can't yeah. remember the specifics, but he, he said, yeah, he you said, gotta get in the car and warm up, you're gonna die out here. And the alien said, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't have any contact with humans. Yeah, it's against the rules, I'm not allowed any contact with humans. And he said, well, I'm sorry, but my rules are, if I find somebody by the side of the road, I have to let them into the car because you, you're gonna die out there. You can't stay out there. Yeah, so he ended up in the cab and they rode for a couple hours. of hours. <laughs> back and forth and then they dropped him off when the ship come <laughs> but yeah. they must have a standing rule they're not allowed to have contact right. for whatever reason yeah and Never then that they saw they saw the ship coming back and he said oh you you better let me out here because yeah. they can't see me with you <laughs> so maybe that's why they always run away and they don't want to talk, talk to you they're not allowed to make contact possibly possibly it reminds me also of um, a a UFO convention that I went to in Phoenix and that was in 2011 um, and at one point one of the speakers said 
I like to look at all the audience because there's always a, a few aliens among you. And everybody started looking around and laughing and giggling, thinking, hmm, who's the alien? Who's the alien? Yeah. And I looked, and there was an alien to my right, a little bit to the front, like against the wall, and one behind me, against the wall again. And I thought it was really funny because I detected them as soon as I walked in. And when the guy said that, I looked right at them. I looked one first one to my right and then the one behind me. And when they saw me looking at them, they both ran out of the room, like ran out of the room. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, why are they running out of the room, man? It was so funny. Well, I wish you would uh, come up with the answer why they always run off. Well, I, I think you're right. They're not allowed to have any interaction with people. But who says that? Who makes They're, the rules that they all have to follow it? I don't know. Maybe it's the, 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 the first directory. Oh, no, no. Uh, the first... What's it called? You know, from Star Trek? Yeah, primary directive or something. Oh, yeah, the prime directive. The prime directive. I think it's more related to that. <laughs> the prime directive, yeah. So, interesting. Yeah. Can you remember any other ET stories that I told you before? <laughs> well, um, yeah, when we were driving up from California again, you had uh, contact with the alien base, remember? And it wasn't a very good one. Oh we're my gosh, you said that. stop, and I wanted to stop, like oh we're going to sleep here, but he's like, no, we can't. We cannot sleep here. Yeah, this other one that you were thinking of earlier. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So there are a lot of underground bases, especially in California. And we were driving back from California and it was very smoky, I remember. Um, and we went through an area, I think it was on the 503 highway or something. 503, uh, 501. It goes from around Vacaville in California up north to, and then it merges eventually merges, I yeah, it eventually merges into I 5 up north. So, anyways, we were on that highway and we went through an area that had an underground base, and the underground base was through what I would might, might call reptilian beings they detected me and they couldn't figure out what I was and I wasn't feeling well because of all the smoke so I wasn't in my strongest self I couldn't necessarily kind of hide or turn yourself off or hide or shield yourself or yeah or even be in really good control of who can lis listen and check in on your exactly. message exactly you yeah so they detected me and they became concerned because that's their area and they didn't know what I was and they came they were coming they were coming and it's like I felt oh uh, uh, we're in trouble <laughs> we have to get out of here and it's like Larry's like I'm going as fast as I can <laughs> and then I had I wanted to stop I was tired yeah it was a long drive we had to drive until about one or two in the morning to get out of their range. Yeah. It wasn't that we had to go faster than them, it's just that if we stopped there, then they would come. Exactly, because what happened was they were coming to kind of um, investigate. investigate, but also a little bit aggressively because it was their turf, their turf, and they, they have like uh, agreements about what species can go where on the planet. I'm not talking about humans now. So the other the other beings, I don't even know if they're aliens actually, but it felt uh, a kind of um, yeah, a different type of being. But anyways, if you remember on the Psychic Assassin book, there's the um, characters of the beings who don't ex know light or dark. Remember those? I do not um, remember those. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, they kind of hosted us in Costa Rica. 
And I put out a call out to see if I could contact them so they can bail me out because I was disempowered, you know, I was sick. And um, so they, they came in really strong and said they're under our protection, don't touch them. And the agreement was, okay, we won't touch them, but they can't stop here. They can't stay in this area, in our area. So they said, okay, you got to drive until you come out of their area. <laughs> so we did. We drove for hours and hours and hours. It was so bad. We were so tired. Yeah. And eventually we got out of there and I felt them moving away. And it was fine. We, could, we found the closest hotel and stayed there. That was very subjective though, it's like more telepathic and the communication, experiential communication rather than physical contact, right? How about at my dad's house, in the cabin, those ones that came in the middle of the night? I don't know if those were alien, oh. they felt more like human, remember that? They were like, they felt like more like human. I don't know. They were pretty intense. I thought they were Anunnaki's. No, they were not Anunnaki's, no. They weren't. They, Anunnaki's don't bother with hanging out on the planet. <laughs> well, some bases, they have a couple of bases, but they don't bother with cities or towns or anything like that. They were, they were That energy that we felt and those people that we felt when we were staying in Squim, at your dad's house, they felt more like the Men in Black type energy, that type of energy. And yeah, the Men in Black are very interesting. How about in Europe? What about Europe? When we were in Europe, we were where there was supposed to be a device of some kind to turn on. Oh, I'm surprised you remember that. <laughs> I thought you'd forgotten about that. I forgot a lot of stuff, but I didn't forget that. Okay, tell me about the device. I forgot. <laughs> oh, come on, just tell us. Uh, I think it was under the ground. Whenever you're around, it can activate, something along those lines. Those are definitely devices which are not from our present human civilization. Um, there's devices that are portals, and uh, gate, stargates, and there's other type of device, communication devices and things like that all over the planet. Um, they are from previous civilizations in the humans that were not earthbound. And definitely what we might call at this time period of our civilization, alien devices. And there was one, it was, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say where, because... I can't remember if it was in Italy or it was in Spain, but it was in, it might have been in France. <laughs> Good job. You got Paul. them all covered. Yes, you got them all covered. Could have been the UK too. <laughs> no, I don't. No? Well, it might have been. <laughs> I do remember there was a car dealership right next to it that had um, Maseratis in it. Okay, so... We're not going to give out the location for, you know, obvious reasons. There's no point putting people in danger if you're going to go and check it out. Because <laughs> I know people who are listening here, it's like, you know, uncontrollable, man. And, um, but anyways, if you're that way inspired or geared, like, um, you want to do that type of stuff and find out those devices, then you'll be able to detect them yourself and go and find them. So. But it, yeah, the, that was definitely that type of technology all over the planet and um, humans have been trying to reverse engineer those for a long time and there's that. Um, there's a lot of technologies that people are creating to that are based on alien technology or previously previous civilizations on the planet type of technology. A lot of that. Uh, that, that stuff around the planet for sure so tell a little bit of the story about what we were doing when we were traipsing all over the place well we weren't really doing anything specific ourselves 
it felt to me like it was interesting. It would be interesting for you to experience these things and go to places. Um, they, I do tend to turn those technologies on. They do come on when I'm near them. In fact, remember that um, that UFO convention I told you about in Phoenix in 2011? Yeah. There was a guy who brought in uh, metal pieces from, um, what's that place where the, the crashes happened? Oh, the Area 51 stuff? Yeah. Well, or the... Uh, New Mexico. Yeah. Please, why is it at the tip of my tongue? <laughs> Where everybody knows where the aliens crashed in New Mexico. Yeah. Not at Area 51. No, they didn't crash in Area 51, but the technology was taken to Area 51 afterwards. And some air base in... Uh, geez, I can't remember the story now. Wow. We're blanking out, man. <laughs> Roswell. Roswell. <laughs> and Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, where they took the stuff. Yeah. So, one of the farmers sons or grandsons had pieces of the metal and he took him to the convention that year and um, I picked he put one on my hand and I looked at it and the things that are kind of hovering just over my hand not completely like I would say millimeters you couldn't really see it I just felt the weight lift from my hand but from above you couldn't see that it was lifting but also it's buzzing, 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 and it was saying, like, waiting for orders, right? Waiting for instructions, waiting for instructions. It was like sentient and waiting for instructions from me. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> that's bizarre, man, that's crazy. And I told everybody around me, there was a whole group of people that were touching this stuff. And everybody was like putting it in their hands and only one other guy they came in after he, he put it in his hand and that's exactly what he said too. He said, oh my God, this is vibrating. It's almost like he's waiting for me to tell you what to do. So there was two people at least that had the same feeling and input like from the metal. And that was really fascinating. The metal felt like tiny little tubes. That's all I can say. It felt like yeah, tiny little tubes. It was all little tubes. <laughs> That's all I can say about it. But it was really, really fascinating. Now I think TTSA and Linda Moulton Howe have it, or have some samples, and they're trying to uh, figure out what exactly they're made out of. They're supposed to be micro layers of different metals that you know you can't really create here now. We don't have the technology to put those kind of atom layers together. Interested, yeah. you can look it up. Yeah, you can look it up if you're interested. Anyways, do you have any more alien, actual alien stories that you remember? Well, I like to say the alien stories that RD6 Killer shared, those are my favorite because you got like a hundred good stories. And I like the story from. Uh, your friend, the one that saw the UFO come down from the moon and suck the water out of the lake? What was that oh, guy? Oh, that's yes. What was his name? Swan. Ingo Swan? Ingo Swan, yeah. Yeah, those, his story is pretty darn good too. And uh, I wonder what stories are, you know, hidden in all of our heads. Someday we all need to go get uh, hypnotic regression and check <laughs> and see what kind of experiences have we had because it seems like they hide in our memory as a, a, a really a nothing. It's just an odd, odd little sense that something may be not right exactly of that night or that experience or that time. And uh, when we pick at that memory we find out, oh, there's a lot in there. But yeah, it probably would change our life. It does, it does seem like that sometimes happens, right? People find out these kind of experiences are a thing that's been happening in their life and then their life becomes about that instead of what it was about. That can happen sometimes, especially if the person feels that they were told to write about it and then they write books and they talk about it and they go to conventions and talk about them, their experiences on the conventions and it just grows and grows and grows 
and yeah I've met a lot of people who's after remembering what happened to them their, their entire lives changes into being all about those things all about the deep contact and information I met quite a few people like that but I also know I also know dozens of people who have had these experiences and their life hasn't changed because it's like yeah those things happened to me and uh, what's for breakfast <laughs> okay then <laughs> Well, I hope that you've enjoyed the talk about ETs and UFOs and we'll talk to you again on our next trip of driving to the res. Yeah, driving to the res on a UFO. <laughs>